our possessed inmates were flown in from around the world. The evening the young girl came to our gates via the bus was an unusual occurrence. The transporting officers rolled her towards me on a gurney. She fought against her restraints. She screamed in the dense and layered voice I had become used to at that point. She wore a tattered and old beige-colored dress. Bloodstains marked her clothing. I made a mental note to try and get her some blankets once she was in her new home. Her name was Anna. There were a few things that made her different from the others. For starters, her eyes were milky. She retained the same faraway gaze they all had, but it was as though her pupils indicated narcotic use. Her eyes never got any clearer during the entirety of my time monitoring her. There was one singular trait that made her stand out from the others. She often quieted down in her yelling when she was in the presence of the staff. The inmates usually never cared who they were in front of unless it was to unearth our secrets or to shame us. She minded her manners. This was as alarming as much as it was respectful. Once I placed her in the cell, I knew I had to bind her to the bed after removing her from the gurney. As soon as I unbuckled one of the straps on her wrists, she reached up and tried to claw at my face. I ducked her strike. I reached towards my belt for a canister. If this were a normal person, it would have been filled with mace. Mine brimmed with holy water instead. I sprayed at her. Smoke emanated from her skin as she let loose a cry of anguish. I undid the rest of the straps and moved her to the bed. I shut the door and went to lunch. The lodging for the employees was three separate rows of cabins. The most luxurious ones belonged to the leadership. The second most comfortable apartments were the priests. The third, and needless to say the most decrepit, provided shelter for the officers. Even though my space was hardly glamorous, it became my sanctuary. I was able to work out, read paperback books, and journal. These activities helped maintain my mental sanity. I stared at the ceiling and thought about how unsettled I was about the girl. Every inmate had a glimmer of humanity. Something about her made me want to investigate her past. Word spread amongst the new employees how there was only one computer in the entire facility. It contained the reports database. It was in our warden's office. Rumor also circulated that he had access to the inmates' rap sheets. Buckley had verified this for me in one of our prior conversations, though it was an accident. I waited until after hours to enter Buckley's space. I managed to bribe one of the janitors with extra snacks. Never underestimate the power of common items in the penitentiary. Buckley had left his computer on without signing out. Navigating the digital database of various inmate profiles was tricky. While I wanted to look up different names, I decided to focus on the young girl. I searched for every Anna until I found the one I was looking for. A few things stood out to me about her right away. The main body of text on her infractions had many redactions. I printed it out and grabbed the papers. I closed the door behind me and headed down the hallway back to my lodging. I read the document on my walk. Even though she was only 20 years old, she was also a nuisance to society. She burnt down a halfway house she was staying at. She was there for many DUIs. Several judges gave her breaks. They decided to put her in mental health facilities instead of jail. She kept assaulting the staff there. The worst of these was when she stabbed a nurse in the jugular. The RN survived but had to talk through a voice box for the rest of her life. I was right outside my door when I heard a familiar voice. You're out late, CO Nolsu said. I turned around and saw his large frame. In the two months I had been there, I got to know the man well. He had come here from the Arizona State Prison Complex. We had swapped similar stories. His tales of the encounters he had with death row prisoners intrigued me. What do you have there? Nolsu asked. A guidebook on how to perform a successful exorcism. I lied. I didn't think you liked to work off duty. We do what we have to. How did you get it? They won't let us use the internet here. Found it under the seat of the mobile unit, I said. I did not feel good about falsifying information to a peer I had respect for. Oh, I see. I came here to ask you if you had any extra coffee. I'm out, and I don't want to go all the way to my locker to get some in the morning if I can help it. No problem, I said as I unlocked the door and invited him in. I stuffed the papers under my mattress so he would not be able to read them. I reached into my backpack and pulled out some instant packets. I gave them to him and saw that he stared at my collection of books. At the far end was a Bible. His eyes locked on it. He grabbed the coffee packs and looked at me. 
Do you believe what they're telling us? Wosu asked. What do you mean? About God and the devil? All these biblical villains taking control of all the people here. It seems far-fetched to me. There has to be something more going on. What if this is an asylum for those with undiagnosed mental illness? The kind researchers aren't advanced enough to understand yet. Have you ever thought of that? I sat down. I don't think science has the answer, I said. The ones in here are gifted with preternatural abilities. It's like they can read our minds, or at least our pasts, no matter how secretive we are. I never felt as though I have less power than I do since I came here. All I know is I can't pretend to understand everything. Whether it's celestial or empirical, I cannot feign understanding of the evil within these walls. To pretend otherwise is arrogance. Buckley, Nwosu, a priest, and I walked together to Anna's cell. We could hear her screaming from within a 300-foot distance. The other lamentations of prisoners became drowned out by her wails. We entered her cell. Words written in blood were on the wall. They were Latin. She stared at us with a smile. Her face seemed puffier than usual, which emphasized the wounds on her face. The priest pulled out a rusted black crucifix. He raised it in her direction as he approached her. Her screams grew louder with each advancing step. He pulled out a small pocket Bible and read a prayer from it. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against wickedness and the snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. Her eyes became less opaque. I was able to make out their green color for the first time. She gazed at me and spoke intelligible words for the first time since her forced visitation. Your mother died an early death because she found out you joined a gang, Anna said with a mocking laugh. I looked around to see if anyone was staring at me with judgment. The expressions were neutral until they turned into worry. Everyone in the room knew they would have to wait their turn for public humiliation. You accepted a bribe to stay silent after an inmate stabbed another one to death, she said to Nwosu. Nwosu muttered something under his breath. He stated the inmate was a horrible person who mistreated children. He commented on how the earth was lighter without the presence of such a person weighing it down. You, Anna said as she stared at Buckley. You are the worst of everyone. Your wife dies by drowning, and you received up her life insurance money. Wait until they look deeper into that. What I saw next horrified me. Buckley screamed out the word no as he lunged at her. His hands wrapped around her throat before one of her legs broke free from its binding and kicked him in the ribs. He must have forgotten to wear his vest that day because he folded and landed on the ground. The priest placed a cross on the forehead and left a permanent mark there. She passed out. Her exaltation before she lost consciousness made her body deflate into unnatural thinness. Buckley called me into his office the next day. He asked me to take a seat with a menacing tone. He slammed the door and sat behind his desk. Do you even want to work here anymore? I know this employment opportunity is a very unique one. It's not for everyone. You knew when you became a CEO that this type of job requires more mental fortitude than most professions. This isn't any different because we're operating in uncharted territory. Have I done something wrong? I asked. You entered my office after hours, he said as he banged his fists on the table. I don't know what your motivation was. Are you starting to believe what some of these inmates are saying about me? They don't see our sins with full impunity? They know enough about our interior lives and what bothers us enough to get under our skin. It's us versus them. Once you side with the enemy, then you're no good to the team here, let alone me. If you're running some kind of vigilante investigation against me, who can play that? Believe me when I say you don't want to be on my bad side. If you're going to fire me, I said, I won't make excuses. You should know I was not trying to get you in trouble or dig up any dirt. I wanted to look up all the information I could on Anna. She seemed to be more in control of what possessed her than the others. I wanted to figure out what made her so unique in that regard. I figured if I ever wound up possessed, I could weaponize whatever she used. You're like a child, he said as he stood and paced back and forth. Do yourself a favor and stay within your pay grade. The Vatican has hired scientists to study behavior during possessions. In the old days, they would have dismissed it as different demons. You don't have a degree in microbiology any more than I do. We are muscle hired to make sure the demonologists are safe when they do their job. So you do yours. 
Yes, sir. I felt as though I had backed down and given him some sort of sovereignty over me. I also knew if I lied or resisted, it would only lead to a loss of money for my family and me. Count yourself lucky, he said, as he sat back down and picked up a pen. I'm not reporting your mistake to any of my superiors. Do not make me regret giving you this break. Now get out of here before I change my mind. I made my way to the threshold. I faced him as I began to turn the knob. One question, I said. Most of the time inmates come shipped here in groups. Anna arrived alone. Why was she given special treatment during her transport? Is she a celebrity? The daughter of a famous politician? It's within my rights to know as someone has to check up on her. Anna is my daughter, Buckley said as he scribbled on a pad and motioned me to leave.